It's now my pleasure to introduce your first speaker for today through music. Mr. Billington, would you introduce Dr. Susan Weiss? Of course, here it comes. Well, it's time to hear from Dr. Susan Weiss. <laughs> She's the one who knows her stuff when it comes to, comes to the coronavirus With a PhD in microbiology From the one and only Harvard University With experience in virus hope interaction Putting her knowledge and her research into action This professor and vice chair is charming and nice So give it up for Dr. Susan Weiss, everybody. So I'm going to talk about the history and biology of coronaviruses. So understanding the biology of these viruses will lead us to strategies for the development for antiviral drugs as well as vaccines. So coronaviruses, um, are, are a family within the nidovirus order. They're named for their nested subgenomic mRNAs generated during infection. You can see here, these are coronavirus particles in an electron microscope picture, and you can see these spikes protruding from the viral membrane and giving the virus a crown-like morphology, and hence the name coronavirus. This is a coronavirus particle schematic shown here. Um, it's actually a very simple particle. There's a very long RNA genome shown here, that's complex with nucleocapsid protein. And around that nucleocapsid is a, is a membrane that's in the blue here that's derived from the host cell. Um, and in that membrane, there are three proteins. The spike protein, which is the, uh, the one that everyone has heard about. It's the target for all vaccine, for most of the vaccine development. It's really important because it, it, it uh, mediates viral entry, it binds the receptor and mediates cell to viral membrane fusion, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. It's also important uh, determinant of tropism, immune response, and virulence. And two other proteins are found in the viral membrane, the membrane protein M and the small membrane E, and both of these proteins are important during viral assembly. Okay, I want to talk about the history of coronaviruses, although most of us or many of us have not heard about coronaviruses until recently. They've really been studied back uh, for like 40 or 50 years or even 60 years. Um, the first coronaviruses we see in the literature are OC43 and 229E. They cause the common cold. OC43 can also occasionally infect the lower respiratory tract. And ever since then, there have been uh, research into these, this group of viruses, mostly studying the MHV or the mouse hepatitis model coronavirus, other animal coronaviruses. For example, they infect dogs, pigs, cows, cats, um, chickens. And there's been a lot of vaccine development uh, to, to combat these um, important coronaviruses of animals. And then there were these human coronaviruses. And they, they've been studied ever since these early 60s and 70s. And from that time until about the year 2000, when the first SARS epidemic occurred, there was a lot of basic bi coronavirus bio biology research. We learned how these viruses entered cells, how they exited cells, how they expressed their RNAs and proteins, which is in a very unique way. We learned about how they interacted with their host cells, about immune response, and, and really a, a lot of really basic information so that when in 2002, SARS coronavirus, the first SARS, emerged in southern China, it was quickly identified as a coronavirus. Um, and this epidemic lasted for only for about eight months because this virus, different from SARS-2, did not spread asymptomatically or presymptomatically. So infected people could be identified and isolated. And really, as I said, it was only around for about eight months. Um, and it had a pretty high mortality rate, about 10%. And after the SARS epidemic, two important things happened. Well, that was sort of the beginning of the pathogenic human, human coronavirus era, as I call it. Um, so we learned at that time that, that SARS-CoV came from, had its origin in, bat, in bats. And there were many coronavirus type uh, viruses in, in bats, and there were many other really lethal viruses in bats. So that's become a really basic, uh, really important to know that. Um, also after SARS was um, identified, People looked for more human coronavirus and found HKU1 and NL63. These viruses cause pneumonia and bronchiolitis or croup, respectively. So then things were pretty quiet in terms of coronaviruses until 2012, when Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus or MERS coronavirus emerged in the Middle East, 
Um, this virus is still causing uh, infections. Um, it's not quite as infectious. It doesn't spread as quickly as SARS did or SARS-2 does, but it, but it um, has its reservoir in camels also with a bat origin. So this, as I said, this virus is still causing a small number of infections. And then things again were quiet until the end of 2019 when SARS coronavirus 2 emerged in, in, in Wuhan, China, causing, uh, as we know, um, COVID-19. Uh, all three of these viruses, SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2, all cause severe acute respiratory disease. And it's important to note that the name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2, and the name of the disease is COVID-19, um, just like HIV and AIDS, it's kind of analogous. Just one other thing about the history, the first international coronavirus meeting was held in Würzburg, Germany in 1980. I was at that meeting. There were maybe 60 people, which was most of the field. The next meeting, or the next uh, momentous meeting, was the 10th International Meeting, in, which was held in the Netherlands in 2003, just after the SARS epidemic, and this attracted hundreds of people, as expected. And the 15th International Coronavirus, now called NIDO virus meeting, was supposed to be held in the Netherlands in 2020. It was postponed until 2021, and it'll be a virtual meeting. So just, I want to quickly go through the very basic information about how coronaviruses replicate. So coronaviruses shown here, the spike protein attaches, recognizes a receptor on the host cell surface, and then the spike protein mediates a fusion between the viral membrane and the host membrane, liberating the nucleocapsid, that's the genome RNA and protein, into the cell. This the RNA is then translated into a replicase protein, which then uh, produces, uh, re re replicates viral RNA and produces these subgenomic messenger RNAs that encode each of the viral proteins. Um, these proteins, the viral uh, membrane proteins, are deposited in the on the intracellular membrane shown here. Um, and then the nucleocapsid protein combines with new genomes and buds into this compartment, which is called the ERGIC, the intermediate compartment between the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi. And then new virus particles are seen in vesicles and they're transported to the cell membrane where they're extruded into the extracellular space. And I want to talk a little bit more about entry and, and viral genomes and how that informs us about antivirals and vaccines. So um, this next part of the talk is what can we learn from coronavirus biology in terms of antivirals and vaccine development? So first I want to talk about viral entry. So antivirals are directed against entry into the cell. So it's important to understand the two different routes of, of, of entry for, for coronaviruses. So the, in the direct plasma membrane route, the viral uh, spike protein recognizes its receptor shown here. The spike protein is then cleaved or processed by a protease called TIMPERS2, and that, that uh, it, um, activates the spike to cause a fusion between the host and viral membranes, releasing the nucleocapsid into the cell. By the other route or endosomal route, again, it initiates by the spike protein recognizing its receptor. It's then endocytosed into the cell. Um, and then there's a fusion event that then um, the spike is cleaved by another protease called cathepsin, which requires the low pH environment of the endosome. And that then, um, that cleavage activates the spike to cause a fusion between the viral membrane and the endosomal membrane, again, releasing the nucleocapsid into the cytoplasm. And it's important to know which, um, which route is used. And many coronaviruses use both routes. SARS seems to use this route by, uh, for at least in terms of the um, in infection of the AT2 lung cells, the alveolar type 2 cells, major uh, cell type in the lung. And so if, if, this, uh, if this route were used, that chloroquine that we've heard about and cathepsin inhibitor as well, would inhibit entry by this route. And the reason that chloroquine probably doesn't work very well is that SARS enters by this route. And for this route, we would use a protease inhibitor like Camostat. So again, each viruses use different, different coronaviruses use different routes of infection, different cell types. And that really bears a lot upon what kind of antivirals might be used. Human coronavirus genomes. So that we have human viruses among different lineages. We have 229E and NL63, our alpha coronaviruses. Um, OC43 and HKU1 are lineage A beta coronaviruses. SARS is a, a lineage B coronavirus, beta coronavirus, and MERS is a lineage C virus. All of these viruses have very similar genome structure. Uh, the, the five prime end of the genome encodes five, uh, 16 um, 
conserved replicase proteins that I'll talk about more in a moment, then the structural proteins, spike E, M, and N in the same order, and then the accessory proteins in the three prime end of the genome. And these are variable from one, uh, G one uh, lineage to the next. So soon after SARS emerged, it was quickly sequenced, and it was seen to have a very similar genome structure to lineage B viruses and a very similar sequence, and hence it was called SARS-CoV-2. So this part of the genome, as I mentioned, encodes these replicase proteins, and these are really good potential targets for antivirals, which I'll talk about in a moment a little bit more, and the spike protein has been the, the main target uh, for vaccines. So let me talk about the uh, antiviral drug development. So these proteins, these 16 non-structural proteins are very conserved among all coronaviruses, and they include, for example, papain-like protease, which process part of the uh, replicase proteins, the 3C-like protease, which is the main protease and processes the rest of the proteins, and then the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which mediates replication of genome and transcription of mRNAs. All of these are very good drug targets, and they're conserved among all coronaviruses. So, uh, for example, remdesivir should work against all coronaviruses. Um, there's some protease inhibitors that have been tried against these uh, 3C-like protease, but it, they haven't worked very well. There are also quite a few other conserved proteins. I'm not going to go through all the details, but these are, uh, proteins are really important for both um, they promote, pro promote synthesis and stability of the viral RNAs, capping of the five prime ends of the mRNA, and protection from host cell sensors and interferon responses. And it's important, again, to stress that these are conserved. So an uh, inhibitor of one is likely to work against um, all of these, all coronaviruses. Um, and here's an example. NSP13, the helicase, is a conserved coronavirus a protein, a potential drug target. This is a three-dimensional model of the SARS coronavirus NSP13, and here's the one of MERS and MHV, the mouse virus. Um, they have very similar structures, so this inhibitor shown here fits into the same binding um, pocket of all these uh, uh, HeLa cases. And similarly, uh, if we look at the effect of the drug, it inhibits each one of these viruses similarly shown here. So this is just one example of something that could be developed into an inhibitor that would be expected to inhibit all coronaviruses, including any future ones. So the last part, I just want to briefly talk about vaccines. So as I said, the spike protein is the main target for vaccine development or monoclonal antibody tar or therapy. And again, the spike protein to each one of these is, has a similar structure, but a different sequence. So a vaccine against SARS will not likely work against MERS or any of the other coronaviruses. Um, so as far as vaccine development, uh, we have whole virus vaccines, which would be killed or attenuated viruses, which are these are the more classical kind of vaccines. And as we know now for SARS, um, most of the vaccines have been nucleic acid delivered. So these can either be in the form of messenger RNA, the mRNA vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna. And this gives the host cell a messenger RNA that it translates into protein. We also have adenovirus-delivered vaccines, uh, like the AstraZeneca, for example, and DNA vaccines are also being developed. So just to briefly show you how this works, so um, the mRNA vaccines induce antibodies to the spike protein that would neutralize virus to, to prevent infections. So a vaccinated individual is infected with a virus, and um, antibodies that have been made against the, the vaccine or against the spike protein will bind to the, to the virus particle and prevent it from entering the cell. And I want to show in a little more detail what this is about. So here's the spike protein, how the way it would actually look on the surface of a virus particle. Um, and here's a diagram of the, of the spike protein. Um, all coronavirus spike proteins are divided into the S1 and S2 subunits. They have to be cleaved at these two sites, uh, purine cleavage site and S2 cleavage site, to activate fusion for viral entry. S2 has these, uh, these are the, this is the mechanism that actually mediates fusion into the host cell. And then S1 contains a receptor binding domain or an RBD that we've all heard about and an N terminal domain. So these antibodies against the spike are going to be directed against all different parts of the spike protein, not just the receptor binding domain. So, um, so uh, we've all been hearing a lot about these variant viruses, so I just want to, for a moment, show how a variant might affect uh, the effectiveness of a vaccine. So um, this mutation within the receptor binding domain has been seen in the so-called UK variant. 
Um, and it could have an effect on, say, one of these antibodies binding, but it shouldn't affect all these other ones. And in fact, it was shown that th this this uh, virus does not is easily neutralized by uh, by the vaccines. And uh, these are two other mutations in the UK variant. Uh, this one might affect the, this cleavage site. This one may, may not have any effect. But so far, the UK variant doesn't seem to be, really be affecting vaccine efficacy. The uh, UK, the uh, South African variant has this mutation E484K in the receptor binding domain, which may decrease the efficacy of at least neutralization by convalescent plasma. So this is really a, a, some, a story that's developing and we need to watch it carefully. So just in summary, to prepare for future emergent viruses, vaccine development and, and, um, and actually um, use of these vaccines is really important. Uh, the more we, uh, the quicker we vaccinate people, the less time there is for, for variants to develop. Uh, we need the monoclonal antibody treatment as well. We need to develop pan-colonavirus antivirals for future outbreaks. And I want the audience to think about um, how important is it to develop antivirals if we have an effect, uh, effective vaccine. Uh, we also need to continue to identify and characterize coronaviruses and other viruses from bats and other species. We want to know what's out there and what might spill over into humans in the future. And, we, and this is a plug for what I do. We need to keep supporting basic virology research so we understand the biology of these viruses. Thank you so much, Dr. Weiss. And uh, I just want to clarify, we are going to go to Dr. Mammon's uh, talk first and then have a combined question and answer. I see some questions coming in. Thank you. Meanwhile, Dr. Weiss had a poll that she would like you to fill out. Keep sending your questions and I'm going to hand this off to Sam. All right, I'm going to introduce Dr. Masai Marmon. Here we go. Yeah, Dr. Masai Marmon, he's up next. When it comes to helping patients and families, he's the best. He's working with scientists and physicians for real transformation. True believer in partnership and collaboration. Yeah, you know there's always more that can be done. So if there's someone that can do it, Dr. Mathai is the one Making a difference in everything you do Yeah, Dr. Mathai Mama, over to you Thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak to you today about the, the creation of Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine to help uh, bend the curve here on this uh, ongoing pandemic. My name is Matai Mammon, and I'm the Global Head of Pharmaceutical R&D at Johnson & Johnson. And uh, it's my team that's been working nonstop for the last 12 months to try to make this happen. Uh, it all began back in January when we first heard of a virus that had popped up in China and uh, was wreaking havoc. And we obtained uh, information about the sequence of that data and literally the next day jumped on it, bringing all the resources that we had. Many in the company felt that the, the, their professional lives, the decisions that we've made over the last decade have probably led to this moment. We recognize that. And we've been working nonstop since then to create this vaccine candidate that I'll tell you about. And, uh, and culminating just very recently in a filing to the US FDA for emergency use authorization. So let's begin. And let me begin where I always do. Every single thing that we do at uh, Johnson & Johnson is motivated by our, our patients and our customers. Within Janssen, the pharmaceutical part of J&J, we're motivated 100% by the impact we have on human health. It's all that really matters. And every decision we make, every uh, action, um, every allocation of resource, everything is uh, modulated entirely by that impact. The more impact, the more likely that we end up uh, doing. It. So here with the vaccine and its potential to literally change the trajectory of health for all of humanity, we, of course, threw everything we had at it. All the strength and resources of Johnson & Johnson were thrown at this vaccine. And honestly, the, the group that's been working on it, even though they've been working nonstop, 
they consider it a true privilege, a moment in their life, a moment that they perhaps their lives, professional lives have been working towards. So it's a, it's a wonderful human story. So on the scientific side, what we did was we saw the sequence coming in from uh, Wuhan on that strain. And we have a platform that we call, uh, call Ad26. It's a human adenovirus that's engineered not to replicate like the, the natural human Ad26 would do. And we have cell line that it can grow in with very efficiently. So very high volume, very high yield. We can produce this. What we did was we went through an experimental phase where we looked at the most uh, common protein on the surface of this, uh, this new SARS-CoV-2 virus and its spike protein. And we looked to modify it in a variety of ways to optimize for an immune response. And that's a very important point. We've optimized for the immune response. We optimize for the antibodies that would neutralize the, the ability of this virus to bind to its uh, human target cell, those that carry ACE2 receptor. We optimize for other kinds of binding antibodies and we optimize for cellular immunity, which is important for um, killing cells that are infected with this virus and uh, allowing for durability, uh, a memory, so to speak, so that this vaccine response we're drawing will last a long time. So that's what we optimize for. And we took this approach and we took the time, we took several months to go through a process where we made a variety of these uh, variations on spike protein and came to understand what was optimal. And so that was an extremely important period where we were able to go forward with where we were confident would be the optimal vaccine. We then put these through uh, its paces. We understood how to um, assess and construct all the assays to assess its uh, immune response in humans. We uh, learned how to optimize the manufacturing of it. We tweaked conditions using some really interesting methodologies to be able to produce it at really amazing yields that the planet now I think will need. And then we began phase one studies. So let me move forward here to the next slide. And these phase one studies were very important. Uh, this is the first glimpse we have of all that optimization we did. And we put it into both um, healthy uh, young adults and then move quickly to as soon as we saw that we had really good uh, safety and tolerability, we moved quickly to an older population, the elderly. And what we did also was we checked a couple different dose strengths. We had the advantage of having used this platform, this Ad26 platform uh, numerous times. We're in development for an HIV vaccine, an RSV vaccine. We have approved uh, an Ebola vaccine that's used in Africa today. So these are these, this helped us pick, pick the right doses so we weren't all over the place. And what we did was we found that the optimal dose was the lower of the two that we studied. Um, we published all this data in the New England Journal of Medicine, so it's available for the scientific community to digest. And importantly, we found a really good uh, uh, multi-pronged immune response. So what I mean by that is we found really good neutralizing titers of antibodies. We found really high levels of antibodies that bound to the virus that may clear the virus by other mechanisms. And we found really good um, memory T cells implying that we would have good durability of response. We found really good um, CD4 levels uh, of response that were so-called TH1 leaning, which is important to prevent a, a kind of an adverse effect of a, of a vaccine. And we found really good CD8 positive T cells, which is what I mentioned would allow the clearing of uh, cells that were infected with SARS-CoV-2. This was excellent. We found uh, consistency, in fact, the same immune response on all these prongs across uh, the younger adults and older adults. That's very important. Uh, we wanna be able to induce a, a similar immune response across all age groups. As we were starting that phase three program in October of last year, um, it was around that time that in the large databases that keep track of virus that was originally used to track influenza virus, we noticed that there were many reports of the virus mutating. 
So this was interesting because the virus was thought to be relatively stable. It had a robust uh, uh, proof editing system and its DNA repair, and it was able to repair little uh, mistakes it made in replication quite efficiently, maybe 100x better than influenza. Um, and But nevertheless, there were so many replications in the world that math works against one here, and there were in fact mutations that were popping up that would give the virus some form of advantage. If, if that mutation were to spread, it, it implies, in fact, that the virus has some form of, of advantage. There were three mutations that really came to the fore right now that are the center of a lot of attention. There's this B117. This has emerged in the United Kingdom and now in several other countries, and it's clearly in the United States as of the end of last year, as of December. Um, and it probably has an increased uh, risk of transmissibility. Um, that's, uh, that's evident. There's, a, there's another one, there's another two that seem even a little bit more problematic, and I'll tell you why, but these are B1351. This was a first observed in South Africa, but now it's in multiple countries, including the United States, as of the end of January. And P1, which is very similar to B1351, which is in the northern part of Brazil, and P2, which is in the southern part of Brazil. The, these last two, and actually all three, have mutations on the receptor binding domain of spike protein. That's the region of the virus's spike protein where it makes contact with the, the human host cell through ACE2. And so neutralizing antibodies um, sometimes have a harder time, even though polyclonal, have a harder time blocking that interaction if there are too many changes. And with um, P1351 and P1, for instance, there are three mutations that are pretty substantial and one, and one deletion. And so these, these become very meaningful and we have to watch, uh, we have to be able to measure vaccine efficacy in the context of these mutations. Prior to that, and uh, for most of last year, these mutations weren't around. And so the trials that were done or in the absence of some of these some of these um, mutations that the virus uh, my virus made. So now let me turn to some really exciting data. So we completed a uh, close to 44, 45,000 person study. What we did there, um, and this will become really important to understand, is we really were a global company, and the world was our our our, our option. So we used a very innovative uh, machine learning model. Uh, in partnership with MIT to look at every place on the planet and ask where it was that we should go based on uh, where cases were likely to be accrued. And this was based on local incidence rate, the nature of the people that we could recruit there. Um, and this required some pretty heavy duty modeling, which was validated over the course of the, the period prior to starting phase three. And in retrospect, just a quick conclusion there is we did really well with this modeling and prediction. It was lined up uh, really much to our um, surprise, like really closely uh, to what we, what we estimated. And on top of that, the incidence rates globally went up, as everyone knows, and that um, helped us from a clinical trial perspective uh, recruit and uh, accrue cases e even more quickly. So this is good but it placed us in key areas like South Africa and Brazil, where these mutations that I described on the previous slide were arising. It's also critically important for me to tell you that data is interim continuing the trial and continue to collect cases and safety data. And we're putting all this data in front of FDA. Um, and we have an advisory committee meeting on February 26th, where we'll discuss this with the advisors and FDA. So all of this is um, interim data, and it needs to be looked at by not just FDA, but by regulators around the world. And we look forward to having those uh, excellent scientific conversations. Product itself, as, as you know, is a single dose product that is stored for several months in the refrigerator. Um, it's readily handled and shipped, and it, there's, a, there's an easy ability to leverage just very standard distribution channels and administration of vaccine, which in a pandemic setting uh, is important, will turn out to be very important to give access to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. We are, because we're scientifically rigorous, we're also evaluating 
uh, a second phase three study where we add a second dose two months after the first. And we're running that in Europe, the United States, South America, South Africa, and Asia. And so here we're, we're looking at that um, and we'll see the results of that probably in the back half of uh, 2021 to see what difference that might make. So right now, let me just um, say that many parts of J&J &J came together to make this possible. Uh, and many groups outside of J&J &J were instrumental. We had many incredible partners in IQVIA, in uh, Colvance, LabCorp. We had uh, many sites with such devoted personnel. We had the participants, of course, in all these trials, 45,000 people that stepped up and uh, were willing to be part of a trial to show that this vaccine uh, may be useful. Um, we made really good use of the, the, the relationships we had. I've, in fact, I have to say, I've never in my professional career seen as many partners show up in such a good way and in such a, a favorable way in a, in a partner sense as we worked across the pharmaceutical industry, across multiple industries. We made really use, good use of data science across the design and development, like site selection that I mentioned. We'll also be um, working to tokenize some of the, the, the patients or the participants in our trial so that we can, uh, it'll help us track uh, data for even longer than our clinical trial can last. We have um, just the help of the U.S. government. They've been invaluable. The Operation Warp Speed Group, BARDA, the NIH, um, FDA, the, you know, they all came together in a very rigorous and complete way, but incredibly helpful way to help make all this happen. Um, in, the, in the course of doing this, like independent of the COVID-19 vaccine, I see many silver linings of uh, COVID-19, as horrific as it is to all of us personally, there were things that the pandemic made us do differently that we never, we, maybe we had in our thinking, or we certainly had in our thinking and planning, but we weren't doing um, as quickly as I would want, and the pandemic just made it happen. Like the excellent use of telemedicine, remote site initiation, uh, remote recruitment, uh, patient, uh, patient uh, uh, information. So all of that went really well and helped the whole company proceed in a way that, uh, uh, you know, I was surprised and uh, amazed by. And it's a, it's a testament to the individuals that work here. Um, in any case, we also uh, took risk in looking at at-risk manufacturing. So before we even completed our preclinical data, we were uh, manufacturing this vaccine in the event that it would be successful and available for emergency use. So that's something that, uh, that I'm proud of as well, that we took the risk and we put up the, the, the resources and funds to make that happen in partnership with uh, governments. Um, there's a lot to do here. We're on the cusp of, I think, offering a vaccine to the world along with uh, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, uh, Novavax, others where together I feel like we will, in fact, as a group of innovators, be able to um, bend the curve here and uh, hopefully return us to some sense of uh, normalcy with time. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Weiss and Dr. Mammon for those wonderful informative uh, talks. I'm going to ask Dr. Weiss and Dr. Mammon to put on their screens and their sound, and we're going to go right into a question and answer session. I'm asking you to keep sending your questions, and uh, Jim and I will be uh, moderating those uh, continually. I do have to make a statement that Dr. Mammon is unable to discuss the specifics of COVID-19 vaccine phase uh, three data due to the submission uh, that's under review for the FDA, but all other uh, data questions can be asked. Okay, so if you don't mind, Dr. Weiss, I'd like to ask you the first question, and that came from somebody that asked for future prevention, any value in regulation of the interface between humans and uh, relevant animal host res uh, reservoirs? Um, I think that's a good question. I think theoretically, yes, it would be good to regulate. I think it's a very difficult thing to do because um, while we know that most of these viruses start out in bats, but then they can be transmitted to other species. So we don't even really know 
where to, where to where to put those barriers. But yes, it's it's probably a good thing to to do. Great, thank you, right. Jim. I'm going to hand this off to you. You bet, uh, Dr. Mammon. This one I'm going to direct to you and and Dr. Weiss. If you have any comments, feel free to add after he does. Uh, a, a question that we've had and that I've wondered as well is, do you anticipate this becoming a little bit like the flu shot where we'll get an annual vaccine? And does anybody have any idea how long we can expect a positive result from a vaccine to last for a patient? Yeah, it's a great question, Jim. So there's two components to the answer. One is, um, as you suggested, how long does the immune response that you've induced from the vaccine last? That will probably vary from vaccine to vaccine. It depends largely on the induction of memory immune cells, and uh, that will likely vary. That'll be measured. And the other part of it is how long the, that immune system, immune response that you've induced is really protective against the form of the virus that happens to be circulating. And that depends on how quickly that form changes or the, the emergence of variants. And you know th this is not a virus that mutates as quickly as influenza. Its repair systems, its uh, proofreading mechanisms are more robust than influenza's, but there's so much replication happening in the world, the math works against us. And unless you could vaccinate the entire world overnight, there will be selective pressure and vaccine and uh, replication such that I expect over the next few years, there will be new forms that come up. Uh, not to be negative about it, but there will be new forms that come up and they may have varying advantages in how they compete uh, for, for replication among the, the earlier forms. So if that happens, my best guess at the moment is we will need some form of booster for the first few years as the world is becoming vaccinated, maybe a couple of years if we're fast. And then if we're fortunate enough that we radically reduce replication, and the vaccines have a durable immune response that they've induced, maybe we won't need to vaccinate so frequently. Um, if on the other hand, we don't vaccinate everyone so quickly, you know, there's lots of residual pockets of replicating virus and there are mutants that emerge, maybe it is something like an annual shot that you can imagine. So the true answer is I don't know for sure, but I'm painting a couple of scenarios that might, might come to be. Uh, I, I do have some comments on, on that question. Uh, so these viruses, uh, as they replicate, they change all the time. They make mutations. Um, and it's only when some mutation is selected for, like for example, I think the UK variant has mutations that increase, that select for spread and maybe also for ad adopting to humans, because remember these were animal viruses. So that's gonna happen over time. So I think those UK mutations are not necessarily, they're not immune escape mutations, they're just um, adaptive mutations because viruses, the best, what optimizes a virus's success is spread, not particularly killing its host, but spreading. So I think that's what's going on here. And um, th there's also the possibility of, epi of escaping from an immune response, which seems to me a little bit less likely because these viruses replicate for a, sh a short period of time. They're not like chronic infections like HIV. So I think the virus is adapting to humans and adapting to spread better. And um, I'm, I guess, optimistic, perhaps if we can, like, as, um, as, as you just heard, if we can prevent too much uh, replication, then maybe they'll kind of uh, even out and they'll stop making a lot of different variants once they're sort of optimized. So I would think perhaps we would need another uh, vaccine booster, but I don't think it's gonna be like flu where it's gonna be different every year because it, it also, it just uh, changes in a different way. It doesn't change, it doesn't have uh, the subunit genome. So I, I agree that perhaps we'll need a booster, but not, I don't think we're gonna need a shot every year like a flu shot. And, and as a little follow-up before I throw it back to Amy, and I, I assume the answer to this is probably no, but, but I'll ask anyway. Is there any way to combine? So if we were getting an annual shot for a few years, can you combine it with a flu shot and have one shot or are they different enough that no, that's going to screw both of them up if you do that? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't really know enough about vaccines. I mean, theoretically, I don't know. I, theoretically, it seems to me you could, but I don't know that it's really practical. If it's in the same, if it's in the same chassis or vehicle, like if it's the same, like for in yeah. our case, if it's an ad 26 based flu shot or something very related so that the drug products are compatible, I don't see a big problem with that, or at least give them at the same visit, at the same physician's visit 
wouldn't be able. Thank, thank you both. Uh, that 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 uh, set of answers was really helpful. Amy, I'll throw the next one to you. Yeah, there's um there are several questions or in certain studies that are out there. So I'll I'll try to throw this out to both of you and ask them both at the same time. Uh, there were there were questions on the comments about the ivermectinia therapy, and also about the uh, coca seeing study and the innovation process in emergencies. And I didn't know if either one of you wanted to address both of those or one of those, if you know the studies. Um, but there were a lot of the interest in both those things. Could you repeat the first one? I didn't understand that. Sure. The, yeah, thank you. I, I could take the ivermectin one. I think there are a number of compounds, right? A number of like maybe dozens, in fact, of various compounds that were developed for some other purpose that were then turned around and tried because of uh, uh, potentially promising in vitro data that they might uh, slow or stop viral replication in, in cell culture. And there are a number of these, and you add to those immunomodulators that might uh, blunt um, certain aspects of the human response if that innate response is in part for making a person particularly sick. And a number of these are in trials. Uh, very little, a very low percentage of those have yielded uh, really compelling data. Remdesivir looks like it's a, it's a proper replication inhibitor and looks like it has value. And um, that's being used right now as a standard of care where it's available. Uh, the, other, the other is uh, low doses of st steroids like prednisone seems to be helpful as an immunomodulator. And there's still a large number of studies, including like the ivermectin data, they're not definitive. And so I would, I would hold on using a lot of the therapeutics right now until there's more definitive data. And the other one, of course, that looks really good are monoclonal antibodies. If you have a virus form that is, um, that can still bind that antibody. And those look like if you treat early enough, that, that is also helpful. Thank you. Um, any comments about this uh, culture gene study, or did you cover that? I may have missed that. Well, mean, it's, it's part of the same answer, I would say. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's one other type of study that's been run. I don't know the specifics of it, but you know, right now it would, it would become known broadly if there, was a, if there was a really good randomized control study that was yielding great data. And uh, there's, there's very little of that right now. Great. So there was also a lot of interest in some of the clinical signs of why people are uh, having um, more reactions to the second vaccine versus the first vaccine when they're given both. Um, any comments on that from um, any of you? And also I'd throw in, is it, is it good or bad if you don't have any negative uh, side effects? I didn't have anything from the second shot yet, no others who, who had a significant response. Does that have anything to do with uh, success or or, uh, or am I just lucky? I don't know if you the, want to in our, our group of people, uh, my whole lab got vaccinated with an mRNA vaccine and the only person that had a, a reaction the first time was the one person that actually had the infection. So I think boosting of the, of the response seems to cause more of a, of a, of a, of a side effect. Um, I will, yeah. I won't comment on the specifics of the mRNA vaccine. I don't know the data inside out, but you know, so-called reactogenicity is the term applied to, um, you know, it's a small minority typically of patients or to participants or subjects that get a flu shot or any other type of vaccine. In, the, in some small subset, it is a small minority, people feel it as, a, as, as your immune system's revving up to respond to the vaccine. Um, it's known that there is, like in our hands, there is no difference to Jim's question about the immune response that's drawn, whether you have or haven't uh, experienced these uh, reactogenic uh, things like pain in the arm or some fatigue or, or some transient fever. It doesn't seem to imply one way or the other what kind of immune response you have. Good. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I actually had a, um, a headache and felt spacey for the day after the second shot, but which is typical, I think, of a lot of people. This uh, uh, this uh, wonderful organization of ours uh, includes veterinarians, and so uh, one question that that we have out there is, 
Do you think veterinary vaccines for pets should be adopted too, that cats are commonly affected by coronaviruses? Any, any thoughts? Would that help control the overall uh, prevalence of, of coronavirus? Well, there, there is this idea that um, that pet, well, cats do get infected and minks, there's this whole thing about minks getting infected and there is a possibility of the virus going back to humans from, from the animals. And actually, I'm going to work with one of the vets at, at Penn. We're going to try to uh, look at some cat sequences, see what the viruses do in cats. And in fact, there's, she has one dog that actually, which is unusual, that had that had, had the virus. So yeah, so there is a, a problem or a possibility of the virus going back and forth between humans and animals and something to be to think about. I don't know if anyone's making vaccines for cats, for, for, uh, for SARS. Certainly there are, you know, cat coronaviruses. Great. So I was wondering if we could bring up um, the poll from Dr. Weiss, because she asked about antiviral drugs, and I thought that would be interesting to tackle at this time. And so interesting. So Dr. Weiss, do you want to comment on this? And I know you brought that up as a question at the end of your talk. Uh, what's your thoughts? I don't really have, I think drugs are important because there are people that won't get vaccinated. There are people, there are this, this whole issue of variants um, that, that um, may be needed to be treated with drugs. And also the, the quite likely possibility that there'll be other coronaviruses that emerge into human populations. So I think we were caught unaware this time, even though we'd already had two epidemics of, this, of these viruses. So having um, drugs, which as I tried to emphasize, can likely, many of them can, if, if they were well-developed, like a remdesivir, for example, should work against any future viruses that should emerge. So yeah, I, I do think it's important to develop drugs, even if we have effective vaccines. So I'll answer that one too. I, I agree with that. It takes a lot longer to develop a drug than it does a vaccine. Um, the drugs that we see, like remdesivir, were made for a different purpose. So they existed and they were partially tested through clinical trials. So all of that is in the world of drug repurposing. And drug repurposing, our history over the last number of decades is not excellent. So these drugs are not optimized for the disease that is emerged right now with, uh, with, uh, with this coronavirus. What could be done, and there's, a, there's an ongoing conversation that's quite good and quite, um, quite good, I think, and should be encouraged, is should one look in the zoonotic reservoir right now and look and try to predict, uh, you know, in the next decade, two decades, if you could have 10 or 20 or 30 of those coronaviruses or influenza viruses, if it's in a different reservoir, that could emerge as pandemic strains, can one get a jump, can, can, can one get a head start effectively, sequence those uh, polymerases as an example, as a target, and understand whether you can you can essentially line up molecules up through early early phase one because there's no virus in the world so you couldn't do efficacy testing, but prepare for that. And I think that's a good thought. And um, you know governments and and private industry should and universities should continue that line of logic to see if you can, you can pre work you can do pre work. Mm -hmm. um, the other the other drugs are not the direct acting antivirals, but are immune modulators. And I think this particular COVID-19 does give us a broad-based experiment, if you will, on the role of the immune system in helping or hurting the, the human. And so there could be some opportunity also for immune modulators, like the equivalent of prednisone, but in a more specific sense. Um, and then of course, we've, we've benefited from decades of investment in rapid de development of monoclonal antibodies so that companies like uh, Lilly and Regeneron were able so quickly to create uh, antibody therapeutics. So in all three regards, I think the unequivocal answer is yes. Not so easy to do it quickly if you don't do pre-work on the, on the first category though. I could just add that um, a small group of what I call classical coronavirologists were working on antivirals between MERS or between SARS, the first SARS, MERS, and now, and there's not a whole lot of encouragement to do that, which is really too bad. And just also emphasize that, that both the, prote the two proteases and the polymerase are highly structurally conserved among all these viruses. So it's a pretty good bet, I think, that um, if we had a really effective drug against any one of those three 
um, proteins that it, it would be it would it would probably be successful against any of these viruses that might emerge from bats in the future. So at the risk of uh, heading over to the realm of politics a little bit, maybe uh, a question that we've had is, uh, why do people have to wear masks if they've been vaccinated? It doesn't make sense. And I would add, or, or why is travel not being opened up somewhat to those vaccinated? And is the question, sim or is the answer simply that such a small proportion of the population is vaccinated so far that it's not changing? I did see CDC put out something recently that maybe you don't need to quarantine if you've been vaccinated? Uh, or are there other risks we're not aware of that make it dangerous even if you've been vaccinated to travel or that, or not wear a mask? So uh, I'd be interested in, in both your perspectives. Well, one, one, of the, one of the big questions about once someone's vaccinated is whether that can they get infected and can they have virus in their nose and can they transmit it? So I think until we really know that, I think that's the fear that although you might have an inapparent infection or you might you might be able to, to me, it doesn't seem like you're going to have a lot of virus replication once you're effectively vaccinated, but if you do, um, you could spread it. And I guess also the, the, there's always this sort of scary possibility that one of these variants is really going to be resistant and that you could get infected with that once you're vaccinated. So I think those are the reasons. Yes, I'll, I'll answer that one too. I think that uh... Our, our program, at least, we're going to measure that and get an answer to transmission. So yeah. what we've done there is we have serology uh, at baseline, one month, two months, three months, and so forth. Um, so we can detect if people have seroconverted through a natural infection, and um, and we measure we measure antibodies that are different from the ones induced by the vaccine, so you can tell. And so if there's asymptomatic transmission or some degree of vaccine efficacy against that, that does, that is very helpful number to, to obtain. And we'll have some of that for the advisory committee meeting and more as time goes on. Um, but I agree um, that with Susan that the, the, the reason is not so much you wear masks not to protect yourself, but to prevent this kind of transmission. If you knew transmission uh, was incredibly helped by a vaccine, that would change potentially impact policy, and so we'll we'll have to see that data. Um, and now, if, on the other hand, if everyone is vaccinated and uh, transmission can't hurt anyone, then it's also not a problem. But in this between kind of place where we are, where only a small minority are vaccinated and we don't know about transmission, you should just wear a mask for the time being. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. I'm going to go to the last question in this uh, session. Uh, one question was, is there any chance vaccination could be used as a therapeutic measure for known contaminated patients, similar to what is done for rabies? Can I address that first? The, the honest answer is don't know. And I'd be interested in Susan's response to this. There are instances where, um, you know, th there's a form of, of, a form of disease that some people are calling long haulers, where the picture one gets is that th this is largely replication of virus for a long time through syncytia. And there's not a lot of there's not a lot of virus in blood, but there may be virus in, in the body. And there, if you do induce a good T cell response, and there's actually antidotes of this through a vaccine, you can clear those virus infected cells and help. I think with people that are facing an acute infection, like when this virus is raging, uh, unless there's something wrong with the immune response that they've induced to the natural infection, it's it's hard to imagine it'll help a lot, but it might help a little in certain certain instances. But there's no data to speak to that second second question just yet. But I, I think it's the kind of thing that should be looked at. I, I don't really know. I worry a little bit about um, giving people antibodies that have long-term infections, worrying about uh, antibody escape and, and more dangerous variants, actually. Oh, very interesting. Natai right. and, and Susan, I just want to really thank you all. I know that your, your lives have been incredibly busy. Or I can't imagine over the last year as this has gone on and that you would spend some of this Saturday morning with us uh, is something that we, we really cherish, and thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah,